hold it in front of you. Right. Here we go. How did you know that you wanted to embark on this journey in your life to become a futurist? Because this okay. is very fascinating to me. Like you just had all this in your brain and it's like, ah. Uh. Very good question. I've always been slightly ahead of the curve. I've always been fascinated by what was next. I did things all my life that people said were crazy. You know, I went, I, I lived in a VW bus, and three years later, when everybody wanted to live in a van, I backpacked around the world, and five years later, oh, let's backpack around the world. I left a job at CBS here in Chicago, took a 50% pay cut, because somebody called me up and said, we're launching a music channel, it was 1980. And I said to myself, 1960, 1980, what are the two most dominant forces in popular culture? Rock and roll and TV. How could MTV not work? So I helped launch MTV, Nickelodeon, VH1, CNN, CNN Headline News. Then in the 90s, I started creating online courses. Oh, that'll never work, right? So all my life, here's a quote, folks. Here's the quote that's driven my life, which, and so, I, so then finally I said, well, I gave a speech in Berkeley. I gave a speech to the department, uh, the directors of educational technology of California higher ed, right? Berkeley on down. And it was these guys all had PhDs. They're like him. They're much smarter than I was. But somehow I lit them up and I said, whatever this is, this is my highest value to the planet. So I decided to call back myself a futurist, right? So here's the quote that's got me through all that. Schopenhauer, in the revelation of any truth, there are three stages. In the first, it is ridiculed. In the second, it is resisted. And in the third, it is considered self-evident, right? So like, for example, whenever there's a lot of resistance, healthcare reform, gay marriage, you know what direction it's going because it's the legacy thinking trying to resist this overwhelming change. So if you remember that, just so as a futurist, one of the ways I see how change is going to be is where's there the most resistance to it? Because it's the last throes of defense before the change occurs. Um, so anyway, I love what I do, obviously, and it's my highest value on the planet. If I can get people to think about the future, Buckminster Fuller said 30 years ago, humanity is at a, soon to be a fork in the road, utopia or oblivion. So my calling is, to some degree, if I can influence people to think about the probability of utopia, it increases the possibility or probability of that occurring rather than mindless powering into oblivion. That's your question? Another question? Yes. Okay, Hold so, it a little closer. Okay, what do you think, um, since all the children, or most of the children now, are doing like touch screens and stuff like that, what do you think it's gonna do to like their fine motor skills? You know, like before they used to have them um, do little things or like pick up stuff and things like that. Or, most like, most eight year olds I see the text do a lot better than anybody older. Right? They have great motor skills. I mean, yeah. now, we find, now we finally realize the evolutionary reason that thumbs are in opposition from the apes, right? Because we can text. But um, uh, I, I think that motor skills, if, if you go, if you see it the way I see it, like 2030 we're doing, I'm communicating you with brain thought waves, right? So the motor skills, that's what robots do. So increasingly we're going to getting away from the skill stuff. Like I teach at this College of Art and Design. You know, if you paint with a paintbrush, you can paint with a paintbrush now. That if you've seen this, like if I blink my eye and I, and I put a brush over it, and then I put the brush on the tablet, it paints blinking eyes. So does, when does art become craft? Or, you know, so it's going to go from technique to technology, and then you take the technique into the technology, you know? So, so uh, we, all, we all need to open things and use our hands, but... Um, unless you want to play an instrument, of course, you can play an instrument on a computer. I'm not, I, I never say something's good or bad. I just say what it's going to be, right? So I don't know that that's good or bad, but that's what it is, you know? I mean, think how much, how, how much more, you know, cursive, how much more hand dexterity that was. Would you go back and write everything now? Because you want to make sure that, no, you do this, right? And then you're going to do this. So it'll change. Another question. Uh, yes. I have a question. It's a micro, it needs a microphone to let the gentleman in the back for the next one. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, I have a question about how do you think uh, with the technology and robotics and how it's going to affect the workplace in America? Well, initially it's going to get rid of jobs until we think about how to create new jobs. Um, one of the things you have to see from, my, from a historical point of view, the concept of a job is a 300-year-old concept that's about to fall apart. 
the industrial age created jobs. Before that, there was the family farm and the apprenticeship and the guilds. And then we scaled up and we got centralized and urbanized. So we had management, right? Management didn't exist before the industrial age largely, right? So we had these jobs, which is why the unemployment rate's always going to be high because we're measuring in outdated metrics. A lot of people who are called unemployed are really making a living. I mean, I talk about we're all moving to independent contractors. I don't have a job. I wouldn't fit. I'd be unemployed. What's your job? Well, I'm, you know, I'm a futurist. Well, it doesn't fit, right? Believe me, how many forms I've gone to, what is your occupation? A futurist is nowhere there, but there's six categories of longshoremen, sir. Longshoremanship, right? I mean, so, so I think robotics initially are going to be perceived as a threat. Oh, we don't need to hire any factory workers. We've got robots. The way to think about that is, what is it that only humans can do? Stop thinking about what humans used to do that robots can now do. I mean, do we still till the land with hoes and rakes? Why would we? Because we've got machines who can do it better, right? So think about any way machines created more jobs than they got rid of. Robots will create more jobs than they get rid of. We're just in this nervous interface about what it's going to be. You know, when the machines first came in, uh, uh, there are a lot of people, they're going to take away our jobs, right? Well, of course they did, but they create all these new jobs, right? Where computers are going to take away jobs. There's more people working in computer technology than worked probably in uh, auto car production 50 years ago, right? So, not, is there another question? Yes. Uh, thank, first of all, David, thank you so much for sure. this presentation. Um, you pointed at me a few times during Because we, he and I had a conversation. <laughs> he called himself a historian, not a futurist. He said, he, I'm a looking backist, or whatever you said, right? I was, obviously, I was joking. I know, but, and I said, you wait and hear how much history I'm going to talk but about. But as right? you obviously know, what I do for a living is I measure how things change over time. Right. And we've had globalization. Um, we, we had globalization, for instance, during the golden age of Spain in the, in the 1500s. We've had human change, which we wouldn't necessarily call evolutionary, in terms of how uh, children today grow up and they almost instinctively seem to know how to drive a car uh, by the time they're ready to take uh, driver's ed, whereas 100 years ago, obviously, that, that wasn't physically, right. they weren't physically capable of that. And uh, you've talked about a number of those things that are happening today and how different they are, but what makes the change over time that is taking place now so different from things that have been happening perhaps at a more slower pace throughout human history? I think, first of all, the question is, why is the change today different than change in the past? Um, I think it's accelerant. It's accelerating, and the accelerant is connectivity. So that concept of an idea whose time has come, right? You know, in the 1800s, if there was an idea whose time has come in Britain, when would it be felt in Thailand? Maybe 150 years. Now it can be felt in 150 hours. So, so that accelerates it, which means that when, the, when there's change that's slow, you know, uh, I always say, if you read Shakespeare, why do we read the classics? Because it tells us about the human condition. Shakespeare never used the word change. Milton never used the word change except seasonal life and death. So in centuries past, we, 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 had, we had a couple of generations to assimilate a change. Now we have a couple of months. So we assimilate the change, but we don't really see, you know, like the concept of place has changed forever. It's, it, 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 people using cell phones aren't thinking that. So, so change is being done onto them and changing their, sometimes their physiology, and we don't know it. So it, it's harder to keep up. Um, I think that... Um, uh, I think, uh, as I said, you know, when I talked about that, you, that metaphor of the thousand, thousand years, next ten, you know, you know, most of the change in that last millennium happened in the last 500 years, and in the last 400 years, and really in the last 150 years, right? So, so the question would be, you know, how, did the, how much different was the 20th century than the 17th? It's the same question. I think, you know, um, I got my degree in art history. So 100 years ago, there were the Cubists and the Futurists, right? Because the Futurism saw the speed of the coming century. Art precedes reality. And the Cubists saw the fragmented reality of our, you know, uh, uh, of, of our uh, five senses, the way it would become. I don't know how to answer that other than I think it's speed, and I think it's global. In other words, um, uh, the British Empire 
It was the first one where the sun never set, right? Outside the colonies, outside the Commonwealth, that change didn't occur. Now that change occurs all the time, you know, Gangnam style, you know, um, because of the connectivity, the speed. I think the speed, the speed of change has accelerated so much that it is environmental. We live in an environment of change. Maybe that's the way to say it. Okay. Another question. Okay, this gentleman's had his hand up for a while, so I want to make sure to get him. Go ahead. You're next, sir. Can you talk a little bit about the collective conscious, consciousness interface technology? You kind of just glazed yeah. over it. Well, yeah. Um, so, again, the vision. So by the 2020s, I believe that on some level, we're going to interact consciousness to consciousness. We won't need the devices. Okay, it'll be a combination of that feeling you feel when you see the one you love, or you're in a Gothic cathedral and the organ plays, or you're in nature, whatever triggers that openness of spirit or God or universe combined with that synaptic, I was just going to call you, and you called me, right? Both of those are going to kind of merge. And then to get there, of course, we're going to have this brainwave computer interface where we're, where we're going to be operating our computers by thinking. I will be able to write a book in five years by thinking the thoughts, and it will go on the page. Okay? So if, I, if, if you think about the muscle that gets developed about focus concentration, it's not that much of a leap to sit and focus my concentration on your brain, and you have it due back to me. So I think the interim, I think there'll be, um, there'll be some enlightened souls. I mean, I went to Burning Man. I don't know anybody did Burning Man. I went to Burning Man last year. There's some hype beings that wrote, did a documentary now that's making the film festival circuit. But the point is, there's some people who, who are my age who are going to lead it, but it's also the digital natives who are going to come up who just instinctively know this, right? You know, grandma is three touches away. You know, let's go to grandma's house. Hi, grandma, right? You know, off to grandma's house we go, hi, right? So, so it's that acceleration combined with the stuff we already know, you know? Um, so the technology, I'm guessing, will be a cap with nodes that are really receptive to thought waves. You know, right now in this room, there's hundreds of thousands of waves coming through us. Cell phone waves, radio waves, light waves, all kinds of waves, and they're invisible to us, right? Thought waves are just the same thing. So, you know, a hundred years ago, if I said there'll be a device where waves go between something in my hand and your hand and you won't see it, it would sound like magic, right? So what I'm saying kind of sounds like magic, but brain, why how are brain waves different than radio waves? They go through. So I really think it's going to happen. I really, I can't, directionally I see it. It's really a leap of faith for you to believe me on this one. You know, I understand. Okay. Well, one of the, I guess, issues I have with the future that you projected there and say, you know, our brand is um, what innovation, creativity, etc. The United States is also the country that has the most, well, one of the most uh, unequal distributions of wealth. And I. I heard you invoke uh, Occupy Wall Street, but that has not changed <laughs> um, since Occupy Wall Street. In fact, it continues to right. accelerate. So, so when I look at the future, how you know how is that going to be changed? Yeah, uh, it's, the the increasing inequality of wealth is the most one of the most significant things facing humanity, not America. There's a greater disparity in wealth between the richest in Shanghai and the poorest in the western provinces of China there is in the United States. There's a greater disparity. You know, I, I don't know if you saw that, but, uh, but a, plot, a, a plot as large as this room was sold for $100 million in downtown Delhi, right? So there's greater So it's, it's global. I think that um, I don't know the answer to this, and I'll ask the history professor, maybe he does, that if you were to look at the, we're measuring the disparity of wealth relative to 20 years ago and 50 years ago. What is the disparity of wealth today relative to 1,000 years ago, when less than 1% of the people were literate and most of the people were hand to mouth, but there were kings? You know, I don't know. I just think that somehow we're looking at this relative to a short-term memory 
rather than a long-term solution. And I'm not sure of the answer about that. But remember, it's always compared to post-World War II America, right? My mental model is in the future where we looking at what could happen like 20 years from now, I don't see with what you presented here that that's leading towards any more um, distribution of wealth that's, that's equal. I, I would say about at the poorest uh, uh, end where people have cell phones now that they didn't and use, use that market model, I definitely think that a more uh, economic opportunity is there. But I'm wondering in advanced technological societies how looking into the future right. We're going to not continue on the path that we've uh, I, I, been on. That that has accelerated. You know, you've talked about accelerations. Right. That's one of the accelerations right. that we've experienced so, in the last few years. And again, I don't have the answer, but another way I think about it is that in the United States, this occurred simultaneously to us becoming less of a production economy, more of a financial transaction economy, and money moves around the world at the speed of light. So there is this emerging global class of people that have their money move around the world at the speed of light. So it's at the beginning of a new age. Like I, I, I would go back to, you know, I, I, I don't know the answer to this, but you know, in the 1860s to the 1890s, the robber barons of the United States, Rockefellers, Carnegie, the great fortunes were created. That was at the beginning of the industrial age of the United States. And there was a huge disparity that occurred, and then it equalized back. So maybe it's history repeating itself that we're in this new age, so there is a great disparity. And then because of some of the stuff I'm talking about, we'll create, and I'm not quite sure I can specifically own the details of it, how will, the rest will catch up. But I think uh, shift in consciousness certainly will. I mean, if everybody's got one consciousness, and it's not about how much stuff you have, but it's about one consciousness, that could be a fundamental equalizer for all time, an evolutionary step in the, in the species. But I don't know if that's going to be the answer, but it logically could be. So I, I think part of the answer is that we've entered a new age, and just like whenever we enter age, those that come into it first, um, the fi finance, right? There's, you know, I don't know how many trillions, tens of trillions of dollars sloshing around the world working for the looking for the best return. Right? And most of us in this room, it isn't our trillions unless it's independently through a 401k or something like that, right? So I don't know. It, it is a fundamental problem. You know, that's why I was so proud and happy. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to contact the president of Panera tomorrow because I want to write about it. And I think he's doing the right thing. So, so thank you very much. Let's have some applause to welcome him up. I'm going to ask for some more applause in a minute or two, but I do want to thank David Hull for a most exhilarating uh, evening. Uh, you accomplished all the goals. You've actually echoed much of what we have done in the University Honors Seminar up until this point. Um, as uh, Michael, as David uh, Hull was making uh, his argument, and his argument, I think you only gave us a taste of what is in the book, Entering the Shift Age, so if you want more, and there's certainly uh, much more in this book. Uh, he will be signing copies mm -hmm. uh, after the talk. Uh, but you began with this notion that we live in such an exciting time, this great transformative time that we live in. And in demonstrating that, you expressed the increasing rapidity of change. And you took us through the millennia, uh, showing how change has sped up ever so much faster. And we are at a pivotal time, so that as we stay put, change is afoot. Um, Ooh, you, a poet! Yes. <laughs> and um, you also uh, discussed the importance of transcending legacy thinking, and it, it resonated with many of us. Um, and you immediately went from this notion of legacy thinking being somewhat of a straitjacket on innovation and change, and we're kind of ground into old patterns of doing things that we need to break out of that. You thought the millennial generation was the generation to do it. Uh, as a baby mover, I just want to point out, uh, the baby boomers were responsible for the 2008 crisis, but the baby boomers also gave us the countercultural revolution, which challenged right. the authority structures of the day. So I think it was, you know, embedded. You know, the the past, the future is also embedded in the past. Um, this is part of a series that the university does. It's a community lecture series, and it is posted on our website 
you will find this show probably a couple of weeks after it's edited and everything under something called the public square. The university serves as a public square in providing the great discourse, uh, as Robert Maynard Hutchinson said, the great conversation that higher education ought to be uh, all about. Uh, David is a, a, not only a product of the University of Chicago, but I later, earlier found out that his father was a professor there and the, uh, the man who established uh, uh, lifelong learning, uh, which uh, was a motto of Governor State as well at the University of Chicago, at the University of Chicago though. Um, so we break out of this legacy thinking and uh, the great conversation here I think was uh, the acceleration of your presentation, but I think there's some a touch of cynicism and you know uh, Terry Allison brought up the point of increase in inequality and it is not simply the swashing of money uh, through the uh, through the uh, economic system, the global economic system, uh, but there's been deliberate political change afoot. So that the conditions of 2007, the distribution of wealth looked very much like 1928. The precursor to the Great, Great Depression, Depression resembled the distribution of wealth that was the precursor to the 2008 fallout. And that it was the role of the state, it wasn't something that magically happened, but it was the role of the state that did not equalize distribution by any means, but made it a fairer playing field. You know, everything from the New Deal programs to the legalization, the constitu the, uh, uh, the legal recognition of trade unions and so on. Um, innovation is a great thing. I think this is where you were going, Terry, with this. Uh, innovation is a great thing, but um, it tends to benefit some more than others. And uh, so there's that one touch of cynicism. What does this mean in practical terms? And you do have to read his book to get into all the nuances of the change that you foresee as a futurist. Um, another uh, uh, word of cynicism, I think, was expressed by our social work student, our spokesman for the social work program, and that is that there is a human factor, that there is a face-to-face -face that is transcendent of, um, uh, of uh, telecommunications, of uh, communications that happens electronically, uh, the personal touch. Um, and thirdly, the notion that change is happening ever so f much faster. If we indeed are contrasting the legacy uh, thinking, which is a, a straitjack, and you didn't use that term, but I think that, you know, I think it's a fair term to describe what you were getting at. If change is happening all the time, what is our reference point for what is of value in society? You know, there's, there's a role for tradition. I'm an old 60s radical, so for me to make the argument that tradition is important, uh, and what I have in mind is, uh, again, um, Alvin Toffler's future shock. That if change is happening so much, we won't have to go abroad to experience, um, uh, to experience culture shock. It will take place in the moment as change, the rapidity of change just speeds up. We'll become disoriented. We won't have the time to reflect what are these goals? Where should we be going? What are the values we hold dear in society? And um, another word of warning, uh, one of my uh, favorite authors, uh, many people went into education because of uh, Neil Postman's teaching as a subversive activity. Well, years later, he wrote a book called Technopoly where he indicts you know, much of what you were applauding. And again, there's a lot to be applauded here, mm -hmm. and you know, especially if you think creatively about the implications of what, uh, of just the last 10 years. Uh, but this notion that increasingly we're replacing our system of values with a fascination with technology. And that he calls it technopoly because unlike past technologies, which were instruments, which were means of getting somewhere, increasingly the technology is becoming a power in itself. So when studies are done and we can cite figures that have been, you know, uh, uh, gone through those supercomputers you talk about, it's given more weight than anecdotal information, which represents more the human content of what is happening. Again, I want to thank uh, David Hull very much. Uh, please read his book. Uh, you can buy your chapter for 99 cents or buy the book at an academic discount. He will be up here signing. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you.